Welcome to The Narcissist Slayers, a podcast focusing on recovery from narcissistic abuse. I'm your co-host, Hope J. And I'm your co-host, Lynn Catalano. And we are both survivors of narcissistic abuse. I am also an attorney working with survivors of narcissistic abuse and the founder and president of the Center for Hope of Western New York. I'm an attorney, a narcissistic abuse coach, and the author of Wrecking Ball Relationships, How to Identify, Live With, or Leave the Narcissist in Your Life. Learn more about me at lynncatalano.com. At the Center for Hope, we offer hope, help, and healing from narcissistic abuse. We are a nonprofit organization with a mission to provide legal advocacy, mental health support, financial advisement, and holistic healing services to help you down the path from victim to survivor. You can find out more about our services by checking out our website, centerforhopewny.org. And please follow us on all platforms of social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, at Center for Hope WNY for helpful information about recovery from narcissistic abuse. Welcome back to the Narcissist Slayers. I'm your co-host, Hope J. I'm your co-host, Lynn Catalano. And today we have a very informative and helpful podcast, we hope, focusing on coercive control. And the title is, How Do You Know If You're a Victim of Coercive Control? Whew. The reason why we decided to talk about this topic is because it's such an important topic for people who are starting to recognize that they may be in a relationship that doesn't seem right to them. I think that your what what we're going to do today is identify the real components and aspects of this type of abuse. And this is literally one of the bedrock characteristics of someone with narcissistic personality disorder. It's all about control and control of everything. Yes. And I think like when people hear the term coercive control, unless you are in this field or you're in law enforcement or you're somebody who's working you know, with victims of domestic violence, people don't necessarily know what that means. True. And I use that term a lot I because I think you're right. I think it's kind of the bedrock of, of what yeah. we're dealing with here when we're talking about emotional and psychological abuse. Yes. But the thing that I always tell people about coercive control is that physical domestic violence doesn't happen in a vacuum. Somebody doesn't start abusing you in a physical way, start hitting you just out of the blue. It's not like they wake up one day and you know, you're know you suddenly having, uh, waking up to a, a, a physical, a physically violent abuser. There's been something that's been going on in your relationship, li likely for months or sometimes even years that precedes that. And that is coercive control. And I think because there hasn't been or isn't necessarily a lot of emphasis on what it is, what it means, what it looks like. And the focus generally is on the physical abuse. Yeah. That if people understood, really understood what coercive control is, and we're going to go through, we actually have made a, a checklist for, for people. I hope that would be helpful yes. when you're thinking about your relationship to kind of maybe go through a checklist like this. But if people really understood what it was and they were able to identify it in their relationship, so many more people I think would be able to get out of the relationship before the physical domestic violence starts. Yes. And I, it's it's really, I think, a warning. Or or at the very least, seek help and and get more information, you know? Yes, true. But I think if if people in these kinds of relationships kind of shifted their perspective yes. to recognize that these kinds of actions are actually abuse. Yes. And that this, again, this is something that I always say, physical domestic violence doesn't happen in every relationship, but in any relationship where there's physical domestic violence, 
it was preceded by coercive control. There was a yeah. course yeah. of action and behavior that was emotionally and psychologically abusive. Yes. That that primed a, a, a victim definitely to you know remain in a relationship that was characterized or yes. is, you know is characterized by these types of behaviors. And these types of behaviors are always present. That's why when I do um, a, you know, sit down with a with, with somebody who's coming into my office, and I, I want to really understand what's going on in the relationship, and when we do kind of a you know this type of a checklist where we do an evaluation, uh, you know, what's happening in your relationship in terms of what are the risks, more right. or less, you know, like a, like a risk of a risk survey that we that we do with with potential clients right. to determine what is your level of risk yeah. when, when you're in a, a, a relationship that you're characterizing as abusive. And if these types of behaviors are on the, on the list, then you are, you, you can fully kind of comprehend and say to yourself, I, you know, I'm, I'm at risk yeah. of my relationship. It, not only am I in an abusive relationship and when it comes to, you know, emotional and psychological abuse, but if there's, you know, many of these risk factors present, yeah. then it's likely that my relationship could progress to a point where there's, there will be physical violence as well. Terrible. So before we get started though, Hope, I know you want to share with our listeners and viewers what we're covering next oh. month. Oh, right. Yes. yes. I apologize. Uh, so yeah, so just so people can, will stay tuned and, and tune in and listen. Yeah, we we want to give you a little teaser for next time. So uh, on November twenty seventh, we're going to be interviewing our certified divorce financial analyst Gina Phillips, who is fantastic, and she's going to be talking to us about the three steps to take to prepare for a divorce from a narcissist. So please, you know, really incredible mark your information. Calendar, stay tuned for that. Yeah. And also uh, a couple other things I wanted to mention. We do have an email address oh. that people can <laughs> can write in oh, questions. Wow. We're going to be taking questions from our audience. Please feel free to write in. Please. It's narcissist. Oh, I'm sorry. It's narc slayers at center for hope wmi dot org. Narc slayers at center for hope wmi dot org. Great. Okay. Great. All right. So let's just jump right into. Let's jump in. This Course topic. of control. Okay. Yes. All right. So. Essentially, when you're talking about coercive control, you're talking about the kinds of insidious behaviors that these personality types use to effectively get into your psyche to to, to plant seeds or sow seeds in in your brain and in your heart. And in your conscience that cause you to feel insecure, fearful, unsure, not, afraid, not enough, threatened, yes. um, you know, uh, all the things yes. that um, over time will, you know, kind of constitute what, what we call narcissistic abuse, right? Well, and what happens is someone says that to you enough, you start to believe that. Sure. And, you know, I hate to say it, but I think most abusers kind of follow, a, they have a kind of a whole plan, like a, a playlist that we hear over and over, right? I think I think they have a playbook. I think they <laughs> get it. I think because they're, they're, the abuse is so consistent. Right. And it's predictable yes. when you, not when you're in it. No, nope. not when you're in it because you nope. can't you can't really see the forest for the trees nope. when you you're, your head you're in this space with a, a, a toxic person like this, a person yep. who's literally poisoning you yes. um, with their toxicity when you're relating to them in that close proximity. Yeah. But when you are able to get enough space from them and you look back and you can kind of see the progression yeah. of the behaviors. Yeah. And it's it's the same across the board, which yep. is why we can say Here's a checklist of things to look out for. Yes. Okay. It, it's literally why, having been through it, we can now help people. Right. So number one on my list here is isolating you from friends and family. Which is something people who suffer from narcissistic personality do regularly, but they especially do it with regard to coercive control. 
So it's interesting because I, I have a similar list and I feel like the signs of course of control seem a lot like the signs of narcissistic abuse yeah. in general. Yeah. So agreed. I completely agree. Listen, one of the things that narcissists fear the most is exposure. They don't want you to go tell your friends and family what they've said and done and how they're controlling you and what they don't allow you to do and what they do allow you to do. So it's easier. Well, and also I think the, again, I need all of these things that we're going to be discussing, we're coming at it from the perspective of power and control. Yep. Agreed. So when you, when you try to, and I'm not suggesting that everybody do this, but I, I try to do this because it helps me understand to step into the mind of, of a narcissist, okay? And their, their compulsion to kind of have you all to themselves yes. is what makes it easier for them to effectuate this type of abuse. Because yes. if you are talking to other people, if you have your very supportive friend group or very supportive family around you, then they're not going to be able to twist your mind yes. <laughs> into the, you know, yes. in, in this kind of way yes. because you have a support system. Yes. So their number one aim is to disconnect you yes. from your support system because then who do you have? You the only person you have is them. Is them. Yeah. And that just reinforces mm -hmm. The feeling of I, I, you know, I can't do this. I, I, I need this person. I, I and, and they, you know, we're gonna move. We're gonna I'll talk do about whatever you say. We're gonna talk about all the other ways that they, yeah. they attempt to, you know, to brainwash you. Yeah. But when the less connected you are to healthier people, the less connected you are to your friends, your friend group, the less connected you are to your family. Yeah. Maybe that your therapist or or some other. You know, oftentimes they will they will drive a wedge between you yeah. and these people because, and this is all very very intentional. I I get the question a lot, like, do they know what they're doing? They sure, yes, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing, and this is intentional because they know the more isolated that you are, the greater the possibility is that they're going to be able to brainwash you into yeah. you know believing the things that they're telling you and that they want you to believe so that they can control every aspect of your life wow so what's what's uh item number two okay so um so item number two is closely monitoring your activity Ooh. and we talked a little bit about this last oh. time when we were talking about teen and young adult yeah. relationships because this is a very common thing that happens in those relationships but it also happens in adult relationships. And by checking your phone and monitoring your social media and, you know, all... Where, where were you? Who were you with? Yes. What did you spend? How much on that? Right. Yes. Um, I've heard this often, in fact, lately, quite a bit. But they will install cameras in your home. Oh, my goodness. Um, they're trying to monitor your activity no matter where you are or what oh, you're doing, they will install the air those tag, GPS, the, yes, the air tag on your, your phone, the GPS your car. in your car. Yes, yes. And, and a lot of times, you know, we're just not aware that they're doing these things. And then they gaslight you out of, out of your, you know, you're suspicious. You wonder, maybe yep. you feel yep. like you're being watched. They get into your social media accounts. They change your passwords. This wow. happens a lot. Um, so yeah, if you're suspecting, that any of those things are going on, Yikes. they they likely are going on. Okay. Wow. Um, and these are major red flags. When you're in a healthy relationship, no one is going to feel the need to control your activity this way. So I, I have a client right now whose daughter, who is 30 years old, has had just had number one happen. And I see the progression that's going to occur. And I desperately want to say to this young woman, please open your eyes. This, this man very successfully has driven a wedge between her and her family and she was incredibly close with them. Yeah. And, and step two is, is coming fast. Yeah. It may already be happening. Right. Well, these, some of the, I mean, it's kind of, it, it's, all it's like a landslide, but yes. it's all, yes. you know, weaved together as well. So denying your freedom, is number three. Wow. And by denying your freedom, it's like they they talk you out of, like maybe you were a very social person when you got into the relationship and 
And then all of a sudden, you know, you want to go out with your friends and they start to make you feel guilty about that. Well, you know, you, why do you want to go out with your friends? Why, why don't you want to stay home with me? Or why don't you want to do something with me and instead of your friends? Or, you know, you want to go visit your, your sister for the weekend. No, you know, I, I, I need you. I, you can't go visit the, your sister. This has all happened with this young woman. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the whole thing about those people don't deserve you. They said terrible things when this happened to you. They weren't yep. there for you like I was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And of course, none of these things can really happen without, you know, we, I think we have a whole podcast on this, but gaslighting. Yeah. I mean, gaslighting yeah. is the, I think the number one telltale sign that you're dealing with a narcissist or somebody that's disordered. And gaslighting is a very insidious yes. form yes. of emotional abuse yeah. because essentially the whole goal of a gaslighter is to make you question your own reality yes and not just question your own reality but substitute your reality with the reality that they are f like fostering upon you and guess what because they isolated you from your friends That's and family right. you have no one to talk to right. and you have no one to confirm yeah. that this is not true yeah well, I mean, that, that, yeah, so it's, it's, it's almost like this, this. There's the playbook. Right. It's the playbook. Step one. Yeah. Step two. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and the, the consequences of, of having, you know, suffering through being gaslit this way, because it causes the, the damage is so severe. Yes. Because number one is you, it causes you to start to doubt your own reality. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you an example. I had a, a situation occur. And I, I'm not going to divulge, you know, names or anything, but it's just such a great example of, of a narcissistic abuser gaslighting somebody. Um, the the person, the victim, had recently uh, broken up with the the abuser, and uh, uh, you know, this is this is something that they do all the time, stalking. And, you know, we're, we're yeah. The, uh, the behaviors escalate okay yeah. and stalking is a very common thing but this guy was stalking her and he broke into her apartment and he uh and this this was a new one i've never i've heard of things like um they come in and they they take things of value this is a this is something that they have that they do often like they'll they'll take your wedding album or they'll take you know, personal effects and photographs and move them around so that you, you're questioning, like, wow. you know, uh, where did they go? Or did wow. I leave it there? They'll, they'll take your keys wow. so that you can't find your keys, things like this. But this particular person uh, went into her home and replaced her shampoo in her shampoo bottle with Nair. Okay. Now, not only we, we're going to get into how that's all criminal offense and all that kind of stuff, um, because it is obviously something that's breaking and entering. It's criminal trespass. It's attempted assault. Okay. All, all of those things, just so you know, but it's, it's a, it's an um, insane form of gaslighting. Wow. Because, you know, she went to wash her hair and poured the shampoo well, this, into it. Thank God the smell of right? there is right? pretty offensive. That's so. right. <laughs> but that's, how, but then thank she God. questioned herself, like, uh, how did this, what this is this? Not I, this shampoo. isn't my shampoo. But then she thought she was going crazy because how did he get into, like oh she, she suspected it was him, but there was no proof that it was him. So these are the kinds of things that they do and they escalate and escalate. Okay. Um, constantly criticizing you. I mean, this is a thing that we all know. This is undermining right. your self-confidence yes. and your ability to make decisions on your own. They want you to, to ask them for everything and ask them, what would you do? I don't know what to do. To a point where you have no confidence in your own abilities. Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. When, awesome. you're, when you're, you know, the only feedback that you're getting from your partner is how terrible you are and how um, everything that you're doing stupid, is awful, stupid. stupid. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, the, the language is often just horrific, the things that they will say to you. So again, major red flag. If you're in a relationship with someone and they're constantly criticizing you, 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 you need to reflect on, on wow. the relationship. Controlling your finances. And we're going to be talking about this. We, we, we've talked about this before. We're going to be talking about this again. But financial abuse is rampant in these types of relationships. Yep. yep. And so... 
if you don't have access to the accounts, if you don't know where the money's going, if you know you, you go through a divorce and suddenly there's this just plethora of information about credit cards and gambling debts and accounts that you weren't aware of. What about things you signed that they said, don't worry okay. about it. Yes. Don't worry about it. Yes. You don't need, you don't, don't yes. worry your pretty little head about yes. it. Yes. All those things. And, and yeah. I'm sure Gina will be emphasizing yes. this when we talk with yes. her next time. Yes. But please, uh, if you're listening to this podcast, particularly ladies, know what's going on yeah. in your financial world. This is a, something yeah. that I can't emphasize enough. Uh, a lot of these relationships end in divorce. You need to know what's going on yeah. financially in yeah. your life. You never, ever give up no. control of your finances. No. And financial abuse is one of those things that is not likely to get better over time. Right. In fact, it's probably going to lead to all these other forms of abuse as you cited in the beginning. Yeah. So here's one that I don't know that people would necessarily, when they're thinking about abuse, would necessarily consider this to be abuse. But I, I wanted to bring this up because, again, it's so subtle and it's so insidious, a lot of the things that they do, that the whole point is, is that you don't recognize it as abuse. So forcing you to live by their rules. And okay, I mean, some people are, you know, they, they're a little more controlling and some people are a little more passive. And so, you know, you, you compromise in relationships. But if you're living with somebody who is like trying, you know, to control every single aspect about what's going on in the house from, and we've all seen that movie with Julia Roberts. Oh my God, you know, sleeping, sleeping with, with the, the enemy, enemy where yes. all of the, the, the cans were going in one direction and had to be that way. And God forbid she moved a can, you know, that's the sort of end result of what I'm talking about or a more extreme example. But even things like which way the toilet paper roll goes yes. and, and God forbid you put it on the wrong way. And then you're, you're going to, you're scared of their reaction. If you don't live by their rule book, then that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty big red flag. It, it is. It is. And that, you know, yeah. I was, I lived with somebody like this Oof. and you know, when you talk about constantly walking on eggshells yes. and all of that kind of thing, yeah. because it's not just that they are particular about things. No. Well, I mean, I'm particular about things. Yeah, well, we're all right. particular about things, but I think there's particular and then there's obsessive compulsive. Well, right. And then that, that, yes. that is a, a very different thing. Yes. Um, the, the next uh, example would be, and it kind of goes hand in hand with this, policing your lifestyle. Oh, so that's where were you? Who were you with? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Yeah. What were you doing between this time and this time? You didn't account for that between the time you left for yeah. work and the time you got home. Yeah, so it kind of dovetails with the your social media and scanning your social media and your phone. But this is even more... This is control. It's more, and, it's more, uh, it's even more control, like... Um, your your hairstyle. You have yeah. to wear your hair long. If you don't wear your hair long, yeah. God forbid you gain five pounds. Yeah. So they're policing your weight. They're policing yeah. your hairstyle. They are policing uh, how you dress. Yeah. Um, are you going to go out in that? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're going to go out in that? Wow. Okay. Um, either they forbid you to wear sexy clothes or the inverse of that. Right. And they buy your entire wardrobe and they tell you, you know, they want you to dress in these clothes, even though you're not comfortable wearing those clothes. Okay. So I must tell you, I once had a client who was flattered by that form of attention because she didn't know better. Right. And so it, it seems like, oh, he, he came to a work party with me and he just sat and stared at me all night. Yeah. The thing is, is that this, again, this is all about control. Not good. And by like controlling what you eat, controlling what you wear, controlling how your hair style is. Um, a lot of times they even like will control how much you sleep. Yes. You know, you're only allowed to sleep at certain times or yes. this could become, it can, yes. it can spin into something very dark. Yes, very quickly. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, and making jealous accusations uh, goes right along with that. Right. So. We've all heard of narcissistic projection. We talk about narcissistic projection. This is where narcissistic projection really comes into play. Calling me a cheater, you're a cheater. That's cheating. right. Yes. That's a huge one. I yes. can't tell you how many times I've had somebody say to me, he's accusing me of cheating. 
um, you, generally what they, they accuse you of the things that they're doing. Yes. <laughs> so yes. if they're accusing you of cheating, that's a pretty much tip off that, that that's what they're doing. But the jealous accusations are, are they part and parcel of the whole thing. So if they're accusing you of cheating with your boss, they're accusing you of cheating with your coworker, they're accusing you of cheating with, I don't know, the mailman, yeah. right? So it's, again, it, it falls into the, the same realm of like the social isolation and policing yeah. because the more they accuse you of something, the more you want to prove to them you're not doing it. Yeah. So then you're not going to go out. Wow. You're not going to put yourself in situations where they're going to... They, they right. win. They right. defeated you, they right? Right, right. Because you can't win by doing anything. I know that um, the, the focus today is really about uh, what financial abuse and what course of control looks like in a romantic relationship. But I experienced this as a child from my narcissistic parent. And it's interesting because there are so many similarities. I mean, most of these are very yeah. true. Yeah. You know, there were um, very, very harsh critic. They definitely alienated me from other people. But the worst thing they did was hold out money as a carrot. And so in this case, it was um, whatever the inheritance would be or wouldn't be. Um, if you do this, then I won't disinherit you. If you don't do this, I'm going to disinherit you. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, ha I've had a, a case recently where it was a very similar kind of threat. Well, the, you know, you want this lifestyle. So you need to do exactly what I tell you to do. You know, I, if you want this lifestyle, then, you know, and the, again, it was tied to the money. It was tied to the, you want to go get your hair done. You want to go get your nails done. You want to drive this car. You do what I tell you to do. Wow. Yeah. Same, same kind of thing. Wow. And that also ties into the, the next one that I was talking about, um, parental alienation Ooh. and parental alienation. I, I, I don't, parental alienation cuts, it, it, it cuts both ways. Because abusers often flip this around and they accuse the victims of parental alienation, which wow. is why I, the parental alienation, we could have a whole podcast on it. Right. I don't, I'm, I'm talking about when parental alienation is really occurring when the abuser is um, convinced your, your child to reject you. And unfortunately, I've seen this happen I have that multiple now. times yep. where the, the, you know, it's, it's usually the mother who has no relationship um, with her children because yeah. somehow the abusive father, and we could get into all the reasons how, uh, has managed to either get sole custody of the children or you know, during their the time that they're with their children, they poison yep. their children's yep. minds and hearts yep. against the, the mother. I have, a, so, I have a client like this right yeah, now. Yeah. And, it's and the very, child very, is very six sad. years old. And they are, yeah. so narcissists like to use their children as a pawn. Yes. And so, because it's never really about the child, it's about the narcissist winning. Right. Or what they perceive well, that's as Well, that's what right. parental alienation is all yes. about. It's, 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 it's essentially, it's again, divide and conquer. Yes. Turning the, you know, turning their children again. Because they know that the, if they can no longer get to you, uh, the one thing that they can still use to harm you is, is your children right. and they will, children are collateral damage with yes. people like yes. this. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Here's one on here that, um, I think again, you might not see all the time, but it's definitely a red flag, uh, depriving you of access to help. Oh. So if you, for example, wow. you need, um, medical assistance, you know, you, you, you want to go to the doctor or the dentist or see a counselor, um, they're going to stand in the way of that. Because again, these are outside exposure. people, exposure, resources yeah. that, yeah. you know, may help you to yeah. see what's really going on in the relationship. So they're going to talk you out of, of getting can't. medical treatment. They're going to talk you out of going it. to counseling, yeah. you know, things of that nature. So Hope, what would you say to someone listening to this podcast right now or watching this podcast? What would you say to them? What should they do? Well, I'm going to get to that real okay. quick. We have I'm three sorry. more. Okay. Okay. Real, three more. Three more. And, uh, and these are things that are going, you know, again, going on in a romantic relationship, uh, regulating your sexual relationship. We don't talk about this a yeah. lot, but this is a huge yeah. issue in these kinds of relationships. Both withholding intimacy yes. and then mandating intimacy. Yes. 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 I and, agree. and, and it's, I and, agree. and, and, and frankly, 
um, many abusive men will you know I, I don't even I'm trying to think of a nice way to say it, but there really isn't they will they will sexually assault yep. their partners yep. uh, in these kinds of relationships and yes. because you know you've been conditioned to do whatever it is that you know they want you to do that when you're in a, a relationship like this and you've been assaulted you don't even have the language wow. to say that it was an assault it often takes years after you've gotten out of a relationship like this to, to be able to admit to yourself and to other people that you, you know, you were doing things and uh, sexual things in the context of the, this relationship that were without your consent, right. that you were doing it because you felt forced into doing it yeah. and that you had been sexually assaulted. So, okay. Um, making violent threats and blackmailing you mm -hmm. are, are other things. Again, we're getting into sort of the extreme area of stuff. But these sorts of things happen. They're all precursors to physical domestic violence. Once somebody is physically threatening you or blackmailing you. You think you're going to do that? You think you're going to take my yeah, kid? Yeah, Wait yeah, till you see yeah, what I yeah. do. They will threaten. They will threaten all kinds of things. They will threaten suicide. That's a very yes, common thing. It's, yes, it's very common yes. with these guys because they know that you're a caring, empathetic person. Yes. So you're not going to do something because you're afraid if you do it, they're going to kill themselves. Wow. This is all about the psychological manipulation. Um, but if they do make threats either to harm themselves or to harm you or harm your children, I, I recently had a case again that where uh, a, a guy had threatened to uh, kill him, to kill his partner, to kill their children, and to kill himself. So this is oh my God. this is the the biggest fear that we have. Uh, people who are in this field, who are working uh, in this field with abusers, that. You know, no one wants to believe that somebody is capable of this, wow. but they are. And we want to be sure that if you are being threatened like this, that you take these threats seriously. You report them. These are crimes. You know, you just asked me, what can people do? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm moving into what can people do? Yeah. Um, if something doesn't feel right, uh, chances are it's not. Yep. If, you know, your gut is telling you that this isn't right, uh, you need to take the steps to get help and whether it be that you reach out to an organization like the center for hope of western new york because we Please. have uh we have uh, experienced providers that we can yeah. make referrals to who understand the dynamics of coercive control yes. and narcissistic abuse we yes. can walk you through you know how to if if you want to file something in a, a, a civil court, like family court, yeah. if you want to file for an order of protection, if you want to file criminal charges, we can direct you to uh, you know assistance in that way. Um, there's places like the family justice centers across the country that you can reach out to and talk right. to advocates at the family justice center. They will help you again through the, fem the criminal court system. One of the things that I know that you've suggested before I think is a great idea because again, you're always second guessing your own reality is to keep a journal. Yes. Not only does that help lawyers yes. once we get to, to, to you, but it helps you to define your own reality yeah. in opposition to this bombardment of psychological and emotional abuse. And I just recently told someone, if you don't write, you don't like to handwrite things. I used to type on my computer and save the file, but guess what? You can just hit voice record on your phone and just talk about what's happened. Because when you go back and listen to that, you know, because this person is going to apologize or this person is going to beg you for uh, you to return. They probably won't apologize. They will beg you to come back into the house and just be back where you were. Let's just get back to where we were. Mm -hmm. Let's not, I'm not, let, I'm not going to rehash well, the who part, said it's part, what. It's part right? of the cycle. Right. Let's you're, go you, the honeymoon. You're, you're back right? to the idealization yes. love bombing phase. Yeah. So um, when they do that, listen to the recording, read your words, do what you have to do to remember yeah. how you felt in that moment. It's very, it's very helpful because it helps to orient you. It helps to ground you. And yes. it also helps when you're reaching out, when you decide to take those steps to reach out. Yes. Develop a safety plan. A safety plan is, you know, having that bag that's packed wow. with clothing and um, cash, cash, identifying information, yeah. you know, passports, whatever. Burner phone. Yes, yeah, burner phone, all of that. 
And if you go to a place like the Family Justice Center or a counselor who has experience in domestic violence and abuse, they will help you develop a safety plan so that when you're you're ready to leave, um, you're able to leave. That you, you know you have a plan Good. for that. Good. And like I said earlier and throughout you know this podcast, the law is on your side. A lot of what we talked about today are crimes. Yeah. It, it's harassment. It's aggravated harassment. It's stalking. It's reckless endangerment. It's assault. It's attempted assault. There, you know, criminal mischief. There's a lot of things that abusers do that really are true <laughs> crimes in the context of the penal law, right. but also in the context of if you want to go into a civil court, like family court, to obtain an order of protection, you can do that based on the fact that these are all. A lot of these things are violations of the law. If I can also add yeah. one more, because in the beginning, your first number one sign to look for was isolating you from friends and family. Please, if you are in this situation and you have been isolated from your friends and family, reach out. They are still going to be there for you no matter what. And I promise you, they will listen to you and they will help you. Thank you. And thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope that this information was helpful and we'll see you next time.